Good morning. It's good to join with you all, and we're very grateful that you're here today on the Shepherd Summit, and we're welcoming a lot of folks who are coming in, so we're very grateful for that. We're going to pray in just a moment, and we'll give you some information. Uh, we trust you'll find to be a blessing and a help, but thank you so much for joining with us today. If you wouldn't mind, let's join together and pray and ask the Lord to meet with us and to be a help. I know I need the Lord's help, and we all do, but let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful to be together this morning on this Shepherd Summit call, and we're thankful for the opportunity we have to meet with other people who have a love for Christ, who have a desire to make His Word known, and we pray that today our hearts would be blessed and encouraged and helped and give us an understanding of Thy Word and Thy work and how we fit in and what we can do to advance the cause of Christ and to lift up His name. And so help us in all these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We've had more join us just over the last few seconds. And I'd like to mention today that we are praying especially for Pastor and Mrs. Sexton. And Pastor has asked me to mention that he's not able to be on the call today. He's at home with Mrs. Sexton and she is ill today. She's been ill for the last several days. And so he's there right where he should be caring for her and so let's pray for Pastor Sexton and especially Miss, Mrs. Sexton as she's been ill and uh, we're praying for her. She'll feel much better soon. I'm sure you all understand and uh, trust you'll pray. And God willing, at the end of our time here, we'll have a, a special prayer and ask the Lord to help her and, and work in her life and his life and encourage both of them. I'd like to say one thing uh, specifically, if you'd like to write this down, uh, Pastor Sexton will be having a Zoom call with some other folks, and also with Mike Huckabee at 1 o'clock this afternoon, Eastern Time. And all pastors are invited. And so if you're a pastor and you'd like to receive the link to that uh, Zoom call with Mike Huckabee and Pastor Sexton and some other folks who are involved in that, uh, please email pastor at templebaptistchurch.com. You can email pastor at templebaptistchurch.com and you can be sent a link to join that Zoom call. So you're welcome to do that. Again, that's 1 p.m. this afternoon, and Pastor Sexton will be joining that Zoom call with uh, Mike Huckabee and others as well, and all pastors are welcome to be a part of that. Well, it is a privilege for me to be a part of this today, and I'm sure each of you are disappointed that Pastor Sexton is not on the Shepherd Summit. I am, and you are too, but we're praying for him, and as I mentioned, he's helping with Mrs. Sexton and her illness, and, and that's exactly where he should be. But he asked me if I would to share some things that have been a great help to me. And I think that these are things that all of us could benefit from because I'm, I'm certain that the Lord has put these in Pastor Sexton's heart, and they've gone on to influence me. Many of you that are here uh, have been influenced by these same things. I have an old Bible with me here. I bought it at Crown College in 1996. Uh, the cover is falling apart. There are lots of things in it. It's not missing any pages. I'm thankful for that. But this is a Bible I've had and used for years and years. And in the very front of this Bible, I took uh, the time to write down some important things. And I wrote down 31 lessons I learned from Clarence Sexton. Now, this was not done in a vacuum. I did this in the United Kingdom. My wife and I were given the privilege to go to England in 2006. And when I got there, I discovered something. My personality was not great enough to build a church. Uh, my intellect was not large enough to go up against the Richard Dawkins and the atheists of Oxford. And in myself... I had no power to do all the things that needed to be done. And so I came to a place where I understood if anything good is going to happen uh, through the ministry God has given to us in the United Kingdom, then it is God who will have to do it. And that was a great help to me. And I arrived in England, my wife and I, with great hope and expectations and ambition and we we're going to conquer the world. Uh, and then by the end of a month, we thought, well, we'll be happy to conquer getting a driver's license here. All these things are, 
are a little overwhelming. I came to a point where I really had to understand if God did not do the work, the work would never be done. And so as we understand these things, I wrote some of these things down, 31 lessons I learned from Clarence Sexton, and these are not things that he told me to write down. These are things that as I prayed and meditated on the Word of God, the Lord brought to my heart, and each day of the month, I tried to remind myself of one of these things. These are biblical messages, and I'd like you to think about this. These lessons that I've written down here are really gateways to great truths. They're biblical truths. Many of them have a well-known sermon connected to them. If I were to say to you a biblical principle like, keep the ox and clean the crib, well, that's not just a saying. Uh, that is a great Bible message, and most of these things you can easily access on faithforthefamily.com, or you can go to the YouTube page, the Faith for the Family YouTube page, uh, channel and look at many of these sermons. So I'm just going to give some of these things. The reason for this is very important. You, as a pastor, are really leaving behind a legacy of what you believe. You may not know that. You may not often actively, intentionally think of that. But you are, week by week, leaving behind something that the people who follow your ministry are going to take with them. Now, I certainly took these things with me in my heart over the ocean. And when we got there and I discovered that God is always previous, I thought, you know, that's a great thing I need to write down. And every week I need to remind myself that God is always previous. Here's the great thing about these truths. Like any biblical truth, they are universal. They work in England. They work in China. They work in Mozambique. They will work in Tupelo because they're biblical. And as a biblical truth, these are things that can help all of us. And here's the other thing about it. They are things that I could teach the others. Now, the truth is this. I'm no longer in England. But there are a group of uh, nearly 20 people that are full-time Christian workers there as missionaries, church planters, evangelists that have come from here, and they have this in their heart. But while I was there and encouraging and working with them, these are 31 things I tried to instill in them. And guess what? Now I'm meeting students who are a part of the work in England that I never taught, that I never was there to help over the last few years. And these students are coming up to me and saying the same things to me. So this is now a fourth generation. Pastor Sexton took this truth and taught me, and I took this truth and taught people like Derek Moreland and Jared Clement and Levi Mullins and Jonathan McClure and lots of folks. And now they've taught another entire group of young people. And now that group of young people is teaching an entire another group of young people. So these things reproduce after themselves. So with those introductions, I'd just like to go, if I could, uh, and give you some of these things. I'd encourage you to write some of the references down and maybe some of these statements and here's what I'd like you to do. Ask yourself, what am I teaching the people that follow me? If I were to, next week, ask the people under my ministry, what are the things that really uh, I've taught you? Could you put them in a phrase? Could you put them in a statement? Could you be able to say, these are things I could live by? Our pastor works very hard at refining his words and like a, like a carpenter would be someone who works with wood until it fits together just right. Our pastor takes a phrase and he works on it and thinks about it and tries to speak, see how it sounds, see if it's most reflective of the truth. And he's done that very well so that we could put these things in statements and they could be easily passed on. So I'd like to encourage you to do the same thing. And so let's begin here with a few things. And uh, if we don't get all the way through here today, if you'd like to email pastor at templebaptistchurch.com, we'll be more than happy to send you an email list of these quotes or also of the Bible references and things like that. But I'd like you to write these down if you're able to. If you have a copy of the book, The Pastor Said, that's a great book to get. It has a lot of his quotes. 
But I didn't get these out of that book. I wrote these down long before that book was published because these are things that got in my heart. And they, while I was here as a student, yet just a young man at Crown College, these were put into my craw. And these are now things that I'm seeking, asking the Lord by His grace to enable me to live each day. So let's look at some of these things and we'll just go through here. 31 truths I think would help all of us for each day of the month. Number one, it all begins with God. Have you heard that before? It all begins with God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. He, speaking of Christ, is before all things. Well, all of us who are Americans, my father always used to tell me, you're an American, not an American. You can do it. If it can be done, you can do it. Well, when it comes to things that we need to do for the Lord, that's not true. In and of ourselves, we can do nothing without Jesus Christ. And so, as an American, I, I want to get a program, I want to get a strategy, I want to be the first to ve develop something that'll work. And this reminds me, that's not where I should begin. I need to begin with God, because it all begins with God. And if I begin with God, uh, He is going to ensure that I'm going to be biblical, I'm not going to do something I shouldn't do or engage in something ambitious. So it all begins with God. Great place to start. The second thing I've written down here is God is always previous. Now this is a great encouragement to me. We arrived in England and uh, didn't really know anyone there. Someone picked us up from the airport. We were given an empty church building with 400 seats. And I thought, It'll be a couple weeks till we have all these seats filled. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to do that maybe, two, maybe three weeks, but certainly I think two is a pretty good, pretty good bet. And you know it took a little longer than that. And uh, we got there, and the first person that met us was a, a lady with some mental problems. And she walked up to us and she said, Who are you? And we introduced ourselves. We were American. She guessed that by her accent. And uh, the man who was with us said, these people are in the ministry. And she scowled at us and she shook her head and she said, imagine what our country has come to. They've put Americans in charge of the Ministry of Defense. Well, that was our welcome to Blackheath. And uh, that same year, we had the church nearly burnt down on two different occasions and people breaking into the church during a church service to, with pellet guns to shoot people. And it was exciting. It was... A, it was an amazing thing. It was never dull. And as we thought about those things, we thought, what is, what is happening here? And this truth helped me greatly. God is always previous. The last verse in the book of Ezekiel is Ezekiel 48, verse 35. And the last phrase of the book says this, The Lord is there. Isn't that a great encouragement? Before you got to that intersection where you had that car collision, the Lord was there. Before you got to the hospital and heard the very bad news the doctor had to give you or your wife, you know who was there before you pulled in the parking lot? The Lord was there. Because God is always previous. We never go anywhere that God has not already gone before us and is willing now to meet us in our need. And so that was a huge help to me to, to be reminded that God is always previous. Before I ever run into anything or experience anything, God has already been there and He's there to meet me. That's the great truth. Here's the third thing. This is a great help to me. Remove all secondary causes. And this is a truth that I think is so important. What does that mean? Look at the book of Jonah chapter 1. Pastor Sexton has a, a wonderfully helpful message on who threw Jonah in the sea. And if you haven't heard that, or at least haven't heard it lately, you can go online and listen to that. But here's the truth. Who did throw Jonah in the sea? Chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible tells us the sailors took Jonah and threw him in the sea. But you read on two more verses. If you have a Schofield Bible, you turn the page, <laughs> and there in verse 17... Uh, you'll find God actually threw Jonah in the sea. And so this reminds us, remove all secondary causes. Something just happened to me. 
Why did that person do that to me? Why did this circumstance occur? And I come to understand, it wasn't just that person that decided to do something to me. God is doing something in my life, and I'm going to remove all the secondary causes, and I'm, I want to see God's hand in this. What is God saying to me? Somebody just tried to split your church, you may say, or somebody just criticized you or lied about you on the Internet. Why did that happen? And we could ask this question, wait, stop. What is God saying in, in all of this to me? Do I need a check on my pride? Do I need a humbling? Is there something God is doing in my life? Remove all secondary causes and ask, what is God saying to me in this? Here's another one, number four, the influence of spiritual fathers. This is a powerful thought, and this has helped me greatly. As you know, we live in the Internet age. And you may not know this yet, but members of your congregation have figured this out, that you are not Joel Olstein, you are not Charles Stanley, you are not fill-in-the-blank with whatever uh, mega television personality they may have. And we live in a world where YouTube videos are the staple of the pseudo-spiritual. So if there's an exceptionally spiritual person in your church, no doubt you've been approached as the pastor by someone who says, you know, I like your preaching, but to really get fed, I have to watch Dr. Who or Dr. Somebody or other, <laughs> some individual who's really deep and gives me a great doctrinal understanding. Here's a verse that's helped me in this because that's all over the world. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul writes to Timothy, But continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. This is a great help to me because Bible truth is not just something that should be information. There's nothing wrong with watching preachers on the Internet, but I need to watch the life and see the ministry of the person who's teaching because I need to see if they're living out what they preach. And as a pastor, you have a wonderful position to be the person that is not just spewing information on a YouTube video, but you are living out the truth that you're expecting your congregation to behave and believe. And this is a great help to me that the influence of spiritual fathers is someone who not only says, here's what is true, but you can watch that truth at work in their lives. And I want to encourage you as a pastor, you may not compete against some of the mega, mega television personalities uh, among some of the folks in your church, but you have something far more powerful than their television broadcast. You have the living witness of the change that that truth has made in your own life and to help our people understand that the power of spiritual, the influence of spiritual fathers, being assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Paul didn't have to wonder what, or Timothy didn't have to wonder what Paul lived like. He knew it because he saw his life. And I'm encouraged by that, and I want to encourage you pastors that the influence of spiritual fathers is something you have on your congregation. Here's a fifth one. The pattern of sound words. If you have a Bible, 2 Timothy chapter 1, the Bible tells us in verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Here's that pattern again. Christ Jesus taught Paul. Paul taught Timothy. Timothy teaches us. We teach others. It carries on and on. What is the pattern of sound words? It is using the words of Scripture every and any time we possibly can, and not substituting our words with it. Let me give you an illustration of that. The words of Scripture are the very words of God. Do you think God has words that are more powerful than your or mine? Of course. And so instead of calling it alcoholism, it's more convicting to call it what the Bible does, drunkenness. Instead of calling it compromise, it's more convicting to call it what the Bible calls it, disobedience to God. And so these are things where we are relying on the Word of God. We're not relying on how zippy we can be with a phrase or, or how 
uh, trendy we can be, but we're relying on the soundness of Scripture, the, the form of sound words. Anytime in the Word of God I can use the truth of Scripture, this helped us greatly in the United Kingdom. Many of the people who are uh, ministering in, in very liberal states where there are uh, perhaps a lot of legislation about what you can say regarding uh, homosexuality or uh, all kinds of different ideas that people may dis disagree about, if you use the pattern of sound words in the Bible, even in a place like the United Kingdom, you have a great deal of protection because you're saying what the Bible says. You're not using euphemisms. You're not calling people names. You're using the words of Scripture. So this great lesson in the pattern of sound words has been a real help to me. I hope you'll study that. There's a message by Pastor Sexton and by others, Dr. Frank Sells, who have addressed this a great help. Number six, here's something that's helped me. The truth is not found in either extreme, but in the full acceptance of all truth. I'll say that again because this is a great help. The truth is not found in either extreme, but in the full acceptance of all truth. And I, I want you to think about this because John chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible tells us this about the Lord Jesus Christ, that He was full of grace and truth. Well, which one was Christ full of? Was He full of gr grace or was He full of truth? It is not an either or, it is a both and. And to avoid a half-baked ministry, I certainly don't want to have one. I'm certain you don't want to have a half-baked ministry. It's burnt on one side and raw on the other. We don't want to have a half-baked ministry. We want to have a, a complete ministry. God gives us a thorough understanding of how to have that ministry. And so it is not just saying only that which is truthful all the time and just having truth. Yes, we are to be truthful, but as Christ was full of grace and truth, it is not just being one or the other. It is being both and. And so uh, there are there's so many examples of this that we could... That we could um, use. Uh, I was reading about someone coming to Charles Spurgeon and asking him about Arminianism and uh, asking, is, is man responsible? And someone else coming to him regarding Calvinism and saying, is God sovereign? And the answers he was giving was, was very interesting. He said, God is sovereign and man is responsible. Well, which is true? Is man responsible or is God sovereign? Yes, that's the answer, yes. Now, you and I may not be able to square all those circles in our minds, but the Word of God tells us that man is responsible. The Word of God tells us that God is sovereign. And the truth is not in rejecting one and accepting the other. It is in accepting the truth that God's revealed Word gives to us. And so uh, the truth is not found in either extreme, but in full acceptance of all truth. Here's another one, number seven. Christ is not to be prominent. Does that surprise you? <laughs> Somebody says, Christ should be number one. That's absolutely wrong. Christ should never be number one. Christ is not to be prominent. Christ is to be preeminent. There's a big difference. Colossians chapter 1, verse 17. He is preeminent above all things. What does that mean? He is not one of, He is the one and only. He's not number one on my list. He is the only one on the list. And He is not just to be prominent in the sense that I give Him regard, I'll consult Him. No, He is to be preeminent above all things. My wife is to be preeminent in the sense that I married her. 365 days a year, she expects me to be faithful to her. I expect her to be faithful to me. 364 days wouldn't do because uh, she's my wife and I'm her husband. That's expected. Well, Christ expects us to have Him preeminent in our lives. Not just prominent, not just on a list, but on a list all by Himself. And so the preeminence of Christ settles so many things. Here's another one. Justification means that God sees me just as He sees Jesus Christ. And this is a great blessing to me. So many people are ridden with guilt even people who have come to know the Savior in their past lives and they, they just feel so very guilty. This is a great truth about justification. I'm sure you've heard Pastor Sexton say this. 
based on Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Jesus Christ, He is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. So justification means this, that God sees me just as He sees Jesus Christ. How is that? Not just that I do not have sin, but God the Father sees me just as if I was never a sinner. He sees me just as He sees Jesus Christ. Isn't that a wonderful thing? He sees me as I'd never once committed a sin because He does not look at me in my sin. He looks at me through the blood of Christ. And in Christ, Christ never had a sin nature. Christ never committed a sin and I am welcome into God's throne room as welcome as the Lord Jesus Christ is because I am in Him because of His work on the cross, His death, His burial, His resurrection. The power of the gospel has changed my life and I'm now seen as Christ is seen. And that's a great assurance to me that God is blessing and helping me and working in my life. Here's number nine. I do not in order to but because of. That's big. I hope you get the, uh, the importance of that. I do, not in order to, but because of. You know, this solves so many problems. I met people growing up who thought, you know, I just gossiped about somebody. If I just spend another hour on door-to-door -door this week, that'll make up for it. Well, I hope you spend another hour on door-to-door -door this week, and I hope you don't gossip. But that's not really the way the Christian life is to be lived. We aren't doing what we do so we can eventually please God enough that He'll smile upon us. That's not the Christian life. We do what we do out of a response of love to the God who gave Himself for us. He is the one who initiated that love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, We love Him because He first loved us. And so what we do in our Christian lives isn't to earn God's favor. Isn't it a blessing to know that God could never love you any more than He loves you at this moment? And He never will love you any less than He loves you at this moment. Because His love is not conditioned on your behavior. His love is found in the fact that you are in Christ, the Beloved. You've been given a place in the Beloved. And so what we do, we don't do in order to work off our bad deeds or, or try to gain God's favor. We do what we do because we love the Lord Jesus so much after all He's done for us. What a better way to live. Instead of living out of a motive of guilt, we can live out of a motive of love for Christ. That's the highest motive. Number 10, the necessity of all Scripture. Now what does that mean? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That word all is so important, that means that all 66 books of the Bible are important. None of them should be ones that we say, well, I don't really have much interest in that. If we had a puzzle, Pastor Sexton often says, with 66 pieces, in order to have that puzzle complete, all 66 pieces would need to be in that puzzle. And so it is with the Word of God in our own lives. We need to know the message of each of the books of the Bible. If I were to ask you today, what is the message of God to you and to your congregation from the book of 2 Kings? Are you familiar with the book of 2 Kings? Enough to say, this is God's message for us? Well, as a pastor, as a preacher, we need to have a working knowledge of the Word of God and be understanding of it so that all Scripture is given to our people. We don't just give them a diet. I don't know if you've ever got stuck on things. Um, one of my children loves a certain type of cereal, Lucky Charms. And if it were up to them, they would eat Lucky Charms for breakfast, uh, for lunch, for their evening meal, for their bedtime snack. They love Lucky Charms. Uh, and they love it because it tastes good. Well, don't be that kind of a preacher. You may love preaching on prophecy. That's wonderful. That's a, a wonderful part of the Bible. But don't become known as a prophecy preacher. I hope you want to be known as a Bible preacher and preach through what the Word of God has to say and feed your people a diet of the whole counsel of God. Here's number 11. 
Take the high road. You certainly have heard that if you've been around here very long. And the high road is not choosing between the good and the bad. Anybody can do that. The high road is choosing between the good and the best and choosing the best in the unending pursuit of Jesus Christ. Here's a great verse, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. The verse goes on to tell us the ways we are to be examples, but that verse helps us understand something. We're not just to barely squeak by. What do I have to do to do the right thing? No, as believers, especially as those who are in leadership, as shepherds, we are to be examples. We are to be taking the high road, choosing between the good and the best in every area of life. I was encouraged when I came here because when we walked down the hallway, we were encouraged, if you see a gum wrapper, first of all, you shouldn't see gum wrappers because you shouldn't be chewing gum in church. But if you see a gum wrapper, you should stop and pick it up off the floor. If you see a piece of paper, if you go into the restroom and there's water and soap around the sink, uh, you should take a paper towel and clean all that off. You're not doing that because uh, you just enjoy cleaning sinks. You're doing that because you want to give your very best in every opportunity, in every situation, to the Lord Jesus Christ. The way you park your car, you don't need to take up two car park spaces. You, you need to park in a way uh, that people can say, that person's done his best. Everything, it's a reflection of our view of Christ that we're always seeking to take the high road, not just in sermons, but in practical life as well. So that was a help to me. Here's number 12. If you learn to preach the Bible, you'll never learn out, run out of things to preach. Remember Dillard Hagen, pastor's pastor from Maryville, uh, told him this after he had gone through Pastor Hagen's library and gotten books under his arms, was walking out of the office, and you've heard him tell that story. His pastor said, Clarence, if you learn to preach the Bible, you'll never run out of things to preach. Well, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 tells us, the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And may God's Word be what works in you. Don't just get your outline off of a, an internet hub somewhere. Ask God to speak to you through His Word. And then you're serving fresh food, fresh bread. Not something you got out of a internet deli somewhere and serve up, but may God speak to you and through you, and then you have something to pass on to your people. They know the difference. And may God help us be people who truly dig into the Word of God and find the truth to give on to our people. Here's number 13. Everything reproduces after its kind. Well, that's a truth we find in the first chapters of Genesis. But Galatians chapter 6 says this, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. I can remember Pastor Sexton saying to me, what kind of preachers would you like to have in England? I said, well, I'd, we'd like to have fiery preachers and preachers with zeal and preachers with boldness. And he said, well, that's the type of preacher you have to be. If you're going to expect others who you work with to be that way, you can't, you can't be dull and dead yourself. Well, that helped me. And everything reproduces after its kind. Do you want praying? Well, it will take prayer. Do you want faithfulness? Well, it takes you and your faithfulness to see that accomplished. Do you want zeal in the congregation? Then there must be zeal in the pulpit because everything reproduces after its own kind. And so let's not be surprised by that. God enables us to understand those things. Here's another phrase. You reap a harvest where you place an emphasis. And that's something that Pastor Sexton often does here. He tries to emphasize what God is emphasizing. Take a chapter or a paragraph from the Bible. Some pastors will take that paragraph and they'll find some phrase or some word and they'll take off like an airplane, but it really doesn't have anything at all to do with the paragraph or the chapter, the whole topic of their message. Pastor Sexton has encouraged us Take what God has done and emphasize what He is emphasized. And then you reap a harvest. You're emphasizing what God is doing. And uh, this, this goes along with number 15. Emphasize in Scripture what God puts the emphasis on. Acts chapter 20, verse 27. 
Paul said this, For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Well, could we say that? Could you say that? Pastor Sexton has worked hard at recording, uh, not just audio recording, but recording in his own records, in his own files, the chapters of the Bible that he's preached on and the books of the Bible that he's preached on. And that's a great, a great thing to do, a very helpful thing to do, so that you know uh, that you've, you've preached. Maybe you have a preaching calendar, and you're planning out in the coming year what Bible books you'll be preaching on and what topics you'll be preaching on. But emphasize in Scripture what God puts the emphasis on. Number 16, find God's purpose in man's tragedies. This is a helpful thing. We've, if you've been pastoring any amount of time, you've run into tragedies. You've run into people's personal tragedies, marriages falling apart, health things, deaths in families, things that people think, these are so tragic, I don't know what good could come out of this. But listen to Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Him, speaking of Christ, being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. And here, uh, Peter is speaking and he's saying to these people, you've murdered the Lord Jesus Christ. You've taken by wicked hands, you've crucified and slain the Savior. And yet in the very same verse, this tragic event, these wicked men who sought to kill the Savior, that same verse says that Christ was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. You know what that helps us understand? That God has great purposes in man's tragedies. In the same verse when it says, here's the most tragic thing that mankind could ever do, take the very Son of God, the very Messiah, the Anointed One, and instead of loving Him and receiving Him, they hated Him and crucified Him, and yet, God was before the foundation of the earth working His will in the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. So when something's tragic, let's not just see the tragedy. Let's see what is God doing through this tragedy? How can He bring good out of evil and joy out of sorrow? And all of these things God is able to do. He's able to do all things. And so we can look up to Him. Here's number 17. True worship is chosen by God, not man, in the New Testament. True worship is chosen by God and not man in the New Testament. Now, this is a tough, a tough idea to believe today. There are so many people who uh, believe that worship is anything you want to make of it. In fact, there's a school of thought that says, Worship can be anything we determine it would be unless the Bible explicitly uh, rejects something. Uh, but the Bible doesn't teach us that. John chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said, Remember to the woman at the well, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. God sets the rules. If you wonder about, does God accept any old type of worship? Ask Cain, how did that go? wasn't accepted. Uh, these are things that we need to be familiar with. Uh, does God accept any type of worship in the Bible? Ask Saul when he made the sacrifice instead of Samuel, and God from that time on judged him. Uh, worship is not something we determine and we figure this would work. I think, you know, I think drama is a great thing. That's a great way to worship God. Well, is it found in the New Testament? It's a good question. And Pastor Sexton helped me understand this great truth, the idea that uh, we are restricted in our worship to the things the New Testament shows us worship really is. And don't shy away from that. That is a thoroughly Baptist principle. You know when that came out? That came out during the Reformation period when Roman Catholic people were persecuting Baptists for being baptized after salvation by immersion. And that also came out because Protestant people were questioning and even sometimes persecuting Baptist people for not having their children, uh, their infants christened. And Baptist people said, well, 
we follow the New Testament principles of worship. If it's prayer, if it's singing, if it's giving, if it's exhortation, giving a testimony, if it's preaching, if it's following the ordinances, that's what we find in the New Testament, and that's what we do in our church service. If you come to Temple Baptist Church, uh, we had visitors this past Sunday. I spoke to them after the service. They said, this is like church used to be 50 years ago for us, and you're still doing the same thing. They didn't mean it as an insult. They meant it as a compliment. Why are we doing things that are 50 years old? We're not. We're doing things that are 2,000 years old, the things we find prescribed in the New Testament. That's acceptable worship to God. Number 18, simplicity and godly sincerity. And this is a way of life. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, we have our conversation in the world. Isn't that a relief? I'm a simple-minded person. I'm grateful I'm eligible to still serve God. Uh, so many people today have complexity as the rule. It's something, if you could ever aspire to their intellectual level, perhaps you could do what they do. But that's man-centered. The Christ-centered ministry is one of simplicity. I'm pointing to Christ. I want to draw all men to Him, not to me. And godly sincerity. If there's ever been a time... When godly sincerity matters, it's now. With all the fakery and all, the, all of the things that seem so insincere, a sincere man of God is a powerful weapon in God's arsenals. I hope you'll have a ministry of simplicity and godly sincerity. Number 19, this is interesting. The means, if allowed, will distract from the message. Now, we live in an electronic age. We live when there's so much media that we can very easily come to a place where we think, you know, that, that's what we need to do. More and more and more and more media. In our church services, we need uh, more media. We need more interaction. Uh, you've all heard the statistics. Uh, you may re retain a certain amount of uh, what you hear, but you'll retain far more if you see it and hear it. And so people are following all kinds of ways to add more and more technology. And Pastor Sexton's helpfully encouraged us, the means, media, electronics, etc., if allowed, will distract from the message. We have to be careful of that. And sometimes we think, well, it's helping us. Well, let's stop and take a look. How did Noah preach? He preached with the truth God had given him and he proclaimed the truth. How did... How did Peter preach? How did Paul preach? How did people like George Whitfield preach? Well, certainly we're not going to wear the clothing of the 17th century or the 18th century. We're not, not going to refuse to use a microphone. But let's be careful that all of the hype and the media and the flashing lights and all the things are not used to distract from the truth of the message of the simplicity and the power of God's Word. What is our dependence on? Somebody ask it this way, if the power went out at your church on Sunday and all you had was emergency lighting, could you still have church? It's a good question. The answer needs to be yes, because we still have the Word of God and a preacher and we're still going to have church. So don't let the means distract from the message. I hope that's a help to you. And uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 23 says, "...which things have indeed a show..." of wisdom in will worship. So let's not let those things become uh, will worship and something that's distracting from the simplicity and the power of God's Word. Number 20, faith is looking unto Jesus. Isn't that a simple, powerful statement? I grew up in a Pentecostal church where your faith was measured by how hard you could run into the wall or how long maybe you could roll around on the floor uh, or how much you could speak in tongues. And uh, that, those are very subjective measurements of faith. But people are confused about faith today. Faith is simply this, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Faith is described, isn't it, in Hebrews 11, verse 1, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, but defined in Hebrews chapter 2. Your people need to know that. They need to know that faith is looking unto Jesus. Isn't that simple? What did the thief on the cross do? He couldn't reach out, he couldn't run, but he could look unto Jesus. 
Only a look. What does Isaiah tell us? Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. It is looking, that's faith, the look of faith, and encourage people in that. We need encouragement to look to Jesus Christ and have faith in Him. Number 21. This is a great help to me. Our compassion must run as deep as our convictions run high. Our compassion must run as deep as our convictions run high. Well, this is a great help. I think of that when I think of that statement. I think of a, a flagpole. And I think of a, a flag being run up the flagpole. A flag that's uh, filled with good things and righteous things. A banner of righteousness. A standard that people can say, I want to rally around that flag. I want to be a person like that. I want to have that kind of faith and those kind of standards. I want my children to grow up in that kind of a church. But as high as those standards are, just the very same depth down in the ground, the foundation of that flagpole needs to run just as deep so that our compassion for people who need to come to where we are is a very deep thing. Have you ever met somebody who has the right position but a, an entirely unchristlike disposition? And in their horrible disposition, uh, they cast far more off than they ever are able to bring to what is truly a biblical position. And Pastor Sexton, by saying this and phrasing it in this way, has helped me understand our compassion must run as deep as our convictions run high. Listen, I'm grateful he took time and accepted me at Crown College. This is a Baptist college. This is a place where you come and learn Baptist doctrine. But I was from a Pentecostal church. And he said to me, you're at a Baptist school, listen, learn. But I'm so grateful God changed my life here. And, and people had compassion on me. And when I had really stupid questions, they took the time and answered my really stupid questions. They didn't dismiss me and say, you're a, you're a heretic. They were welcoming and kind, but they spoke the truth in love. And I'm thankful for that. I'm an example of someone who, people with great high standards and convictions, had a deep compassion toward and I'm forever grateful for that. Here's another one, 22. Keep the ox and clean the crib. Proverbs 14 and verse 4. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Don't you need that every Monday? I don't know about you, but I pastored for 11 years in England, and every Monday I needed to be reminded of keep the ox and clean the crib. And you probably have far better Mondays than I had as a pastor. But I just wondered if people set their alarm at 6.30 in the morning and waited for the last, oh, 18 months or so with every negative, bad, horrible story they could think of and wanted to call me as soon as they possibly could on Monday morning. Has that ever happened to you? That can happen, can it? And you can think, you know... Will this, ever, will this ever get better? Will people's problems ever be solved? And the fact is this, God is at work and He is working through people. And let's not get discouraged. Let's be reminded that we can be people who trust God because we need the ox to have the increase and God can enable us to clean the crib and to keep our own hearts right. Number 23, Ye shall hold your peace and the Lord shall fight for you. That's a Bible verse. Exodus 14, verse 14. Ye shall hold your peace, and the Lord shall fight for you. Trusting God with your character. Trusting God with your reputation. Did God call you into the ministry? Did God call you to that church? Then God will care for you. I can remember speaking to Pastor Sexton, and he tells me, uh, in a difficult situation, he says, don't go defend yourself. Trust in the Lord. Let Him defend you. Hold your peace. The Lord will fight for you. And what a freeing thought that is, that we don't have to go around defending our own reputation every day, that we live under the authority of God and in the fear of God, and God will enable us and help us in these things. Here's another one. Number 24, preach for an audience of one. Well, what one is that? Is that you? Is that your wife? Is that the, the head deacon? No. 
Preach for an audience of one, the Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, Paul writes to Timothy that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. That he may please him that hath chosen him to be a soldier. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. I'm thankful to know that when I get up to preach, whatever I say, if I say it with the fear of God, I don't have to fear the people I'm preaching to. And I can be someone who, when I meet God with the pastorate He has given me, with the sermon opportunity that this Sunday you could say that He has given me, I know I'll answer to Him for obeying Him. Not cutting corners, not slacking off and addressing sin, not calling out sin. I'll, I'll be someone who is brave enough to do that because... I'm preaching for an audience of one, and I hope you'll be a person who has that. Number 25, reverence is my true measurement of my view of God. Reverence is my true measurement of my view of God. And reverence is something that is missing in many places today. It's almost like a dinosaur. It's an elusive being that is very hard to find in many churches. What is reverence? It's my heart view toward God. When I pray, I, I noticed when I came here as a young person from a different background, and Pastor Sexton got up to pray on Sunday morning as the church service opened, he said, stop right where you're at. The ushers were coming in, or maybe guests were filing in, or maybe someone was a little late. And he would say to everyone, stop right where you're at. Please be still. We're going to pray together. He invited everyone to pray. He, we weren't just listening to Him pray. He invited all of us to come into the throne room of God together and to pray. I'd never heard that before. When, when I was at the church I was at, prayer time was the time where everybody got up on the platform and adjusted all the microphone stands and made sure the piano was right and made sure everybody had the sheet music in the choir. And it was kind of the time where you hoped people would close their eyes so you could do all the transitions on the platform. Here it was very different. And I was curious about that. Why when we pray here are we still? Why do we take a moment? Why does Pastor Sex not just rush right into prayer? Why does he pause? And I asked him one day, why do you do these things? I, I don't understand. This is different than anything I've ever seen. And he said something I, I haven't forgotten yet. He said, I pause to pray because I want to remind myself whose presence I'm going into. He went on to explain, if, if he were going to meet the President of the United States and that President was just in the room on the other side of the wall, before he walked into that room, he would try to make sure that he looked appropriate. He'd, he'd make sure if he could that his tie was straight and his collar was correct. and He'd try to make sure his hair was appropriate before he went in to meet the President because it's a high honor to meet the President. And if we're going into the presence of God, we're not just going to rush in bringing all the, all the odors of the world with us. We want to have our minds lifted high to look unto Jesus and to have faith and to come together as a congregation. So that's why he paused. He encouraged people to stop because we want to have reverence for God. So reverence is a true measurement of our view of God. How do we sing the hymns? Do we sing them on our very best because we have reverence, we have a, a set-aside regard for the God who is holy. Well, these are just some of the things. I don't have time to go on, but we will have all 31 of those things. If you'd like them, again, you're welcome to email pastor at templebaptistchurch.com, and you can get a list of all these along with the references today. Thank you for your patience, and I'm grateful that you uh, tuned in today. And we'd like to pray specifically now for Mrs. Sexton and for Pastor Sexton if you wouldn't mind to join with me in prayer and all of us together praying for them, I know it'll be a great encouragement to them to know that you'll be praying for her too. She's at home. She's not in the hospital. We're thankful for that. But she's just been ill and dealing with, with some things, and so we're praying much for them. And uh, Pastor Sexton will be on that Zoom call, remember, today at 1 p.m. And again, if you'd like that link, you can email pastor at templebaptistchurch.com and they can send you the link. And if you'd like this list, um, you're welcome to that as well. Uh, this, as I said, has been a privilege for me today. 
And I'm so grateful that you not only joined in, but you brave souls that stuck, stuck with it all the way through. And I'm grateful for that. And I see so many familiar faces we know and love and so grateful for you. You'll never know how much of a uh, great encouragement this is to our pastor. And so I want to personally thank you for being so faithful in joining these Shepherd Summits through the weeks. And I trust they've been a blessing to you. Could we pray together and ask the Lord to help us and to bless especially Mrs. Sexton? Our gracious God, we thank Thee for the truth that is in Thy Word. We're thankful for how it is universally applicable anywhere in the world that these truths are powerful because they're from Thy Word. We're thankful that they can be passed on to coming generations. We're thankful they made a difference in our lives and we pray that they make a great difference in the lives of those we help and encourage and teach and preach to. Please help Mrs. Sexton today. We're thankful uh, that she's feeling a bit better. Please help her recover quickly and thoroughly and we pray that she would be feeling much better soon and be able to be back at church and be able to join us. Help Pastor Sexton and as he helps and cares for her and encourages her. We pray for this Zoom call at 1 o'clock with Mike Huckabee and others. And we pray that uh, the Lord may be glorified. We pray especially for our nation and this upcoming election that's just a few weeks away. And we pray that in wrath, we certainly deserve Thy wrath. The blood of millions of unborn babies cry out for justice. And so there's no doubt that this nation deserves Thy wrath, but we would pray in wrath to remember mercy. And we pray for a reviving in our land. We pray that this land would turn to Thee, that we would be repentant, that we would come to understand that without Thee we can do nothing. And we pray for a reviving in our own hearts, in the lives of our churches. Bless these dear pastors who came to this Zoom call today to be encouraged. We pray that they may be helped and blessed Use them powerfully. Give them an uplifting. We pray that they may be given great resolve and a sternness to follow through and not be discouraged, not be downcast, but to seek Thee and find power through prayer. And may we be people who lift up and encourage one another. We're thankful for this opportunity now. Bless us and help us. And we pray this week would be especially blessed to each of these pastors in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. God bless you. We're grateful you joined us today.